Hi, everybody. I'm Charles Hosail. Um, welcome to um, Accessibility Features for Digital Audiovisual Collections content. Um, I'm an archivist at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and um, I'll let Kate introduce herself. I'm Kate Murray from Badgie in the Library of Congress. Yeah. All right. So uh, I already said I'm an archivist at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress in the United States. Um, in my role as an archivist at AFC, I participate in the Federal Agency's Digital Guidelines Initiative, FAGI, and I'm presenting with Kate here today, who leads the FAGI AV Working Group. Um, we're going to discuss FAGI's new AV Accessibility Subgroup and our work documenting and exploring accessibility features of digital audiovisual collections content. Our explorations are primarily concerned with the context of the US federal government, but um, they have broader applications and utility too. We see their reuse throughout the community. Um, just as an aside, um, note that all FAGI products uh, have defined CC licenses, which is CC universal license for worldwide use and reuse, and they're always free of charge. If you're not already familiar with FAGI, um, check out our website or catch up with Kate or myself or any other FAGI participants. It's digitizationguidelines.gov. Um, the accessibility subgroup was formed uh, after accessibility features were highlighted as a concern at FAGI's December 2021 AV Working Group meeting. Uh, some major discussion points were a lack of guidelines for creating and presenting audio description of AV content best practices for when to embed or when to use sidecar files, especially for subtitles, and the functionality of different AV players and web players. Um, in discussions among subgroup members, uh, we took note of and were concerned about the proliferation of AV web presentations, the use of different uh, players across the government, different agencies following different laws and guidelines and providing different user experiences and different approaches to when and what content gets particular accessibility features or enhancements. Uh, the goal of forming the subgroup was to create more discussion and uniformity amongst FAGI members, especially around accessibility of collections content. Uh, we focused on digital audiovisual collections content as distinct from content that an agency creates as routine government records. In conversing the subject, we observed that agency publications and documents often follow different workflows, rules, reg regulations, and records management practices than um, cultural heritage collections material and content. In some cases, it appeared that different departments managed access to agency records uh, versus collections content. The gaps and needs that were coming into focus primarily concerned collections content. And med many of the FAGI participants are the custodians of that content and are primarily concerned with it. So we narrowed our focus to practices and considerations of that material. So we formed the subgroup and set out to plan our work. Uh, we discussed the current environments at the various, various institutions we represent and what goals and deliverables would be most beneficial to the group. We discussed differences and similarities between our institution's practices and systems. Um, and as we started to talk about these needs and gaps, we also considered and shared resources that already existed, uh, especially publications by IASA and uh, safety standards and the like. We decided to focus our first round of work on two deliverables. One, a set of definitions that would establish a common language between institutions, and two, a survey of accessibility features and practices at uh, federal agencies with cultural heritage collections. Uh, at the same time, we noted that AMIA had formed their new accessibility committee uh, at nearly the same time that we decided to form our subcommittee. So we reached out to them to make them aware of the efforts we were planning and to share our working documents. Uh, it's pretty clear that there are needs and gaps being identified and addressed like across the entire AV community right now, which is exciting. So our group's first report is our definitions of 
uh, definitions for key accessibility features for digital audiovisual collections content. Uh, you can read the report on the FAGI website at digitizationguidelines.gov slash guidelines slash accessibility underscore AV underscore collections. Uh, we held a few meetings and did independent research to collaboratively create this document. Uh, we placed a draft up for public comment on July 12th of this year, and it was up until August 15th. And during that, we received really useful feedback. Um, thanks to everybody, including some people here today, I'm sure, uh, that shared their expertise. If you have more feedback, please share it with uh, Kate via the FAGI website or Kate's email, which will be up at the end of the presentation. This document is organized into two main informative sections. Uh, the first is a summary chart of accessibility features for audiovisual content, and the second is the definitions. It also has brief discussions of subtitle and caption formats and accessibility functions in different AV players, along with a list of resources we consulted. The first section of the definitions document is the summary chart, where we've collected info about AV accessibility features, their use, their functionality, related file formats, corresponding rules, US laws and guidelines, and any applicable technical standards. We consulted WCAG, uh, Section 508, which is our American resources, uh, FCC guidelines and CFR rules, along with uh, file format and encoding standards. And we interpreted uh, these documents application to the various accessibility features. If you see a gap or have other information to add, please let us know. The image on this slide is a screenshot of the chart. Um, and the portion of the chart with information concerning audio description. We've observed that audio description, when presented to users, can either be a sidecar file or embedded in the uh, media file. Various WCAG, 508, and FCC rules and guidelines discuss audio description, and a variety of technical standards explain how to exploit audio description. The accessibility features we examined in the chart are audio description, closed captions, open captions, sign language interpretation, subtitles, and transcripts. The second section of the definitions document is, unsurprisingly, the definitions themselves. The definitions are intended to create a common language and share understanding between FAGI members and to serve as a brief introduction to AV accessibility features. The features we've defined are audio description, closed captions, EBU STL, closed captions, sign language interpretation, subtitles, teletext, time text, transcriptions, transcripts, and video description. The image on the screen is our definition of subtitles. It was surprisingly fun to figure out the difference between subtitles and captions and what those teams terms mean in different industries, countries, and languages. The other definitions have similar, similarly robust information. Now I'm going to pass it off to Kate to talk about our second bullet. Um, but before I do that, just a shout out to Charles, who only knew he was going to do this live about an hour ago. So um, thank you, Charles. Um, so the group's second publication, which was just published this week, is uh, survey results, the current state of, ac of accessibility features um, for audiovisual collections content in five FADGI institutions. Um, it's also available on, our, on the FADGI website. Um, I'm not going to read out that URL, but um, you can get to it from the Badgie homepage. So in spring 2020, the subgroup created a survey to gather information about accessibility compliance, oops, sorry, um, about accessibility compliance um, for archival audiovisual collections content in US federal agencies. And so um, as a reminder, archival collections content is uh, stuff that comes in through collection development policies, not stuff that, that is created by an institution like a webcast or something like that. So this is older material, current material that's in our collections. Um, the responding institutions, um, so the survey was distributed to uh, FADGI members who answered as representatives for their institutions. We received responses from five large federal agencies, but we are counting all of the Smithsonian institutions as one here. So this is actually a really great return rate. The survey mainly serves as a snapshot for the current use and implementation of accessibility features at these institutions. And so the responding institutions are the Library of Congress, NARA, which is the, the US National Archives and Records Administration, the Architect of the Capitol, 
the National Library of Medicine, and the Smithsonian. And the survey questions were grouped into four major areas, so we'll walk through a summary of findings for each of those sections. Um, the first group of questions related to federal accessibility rules and guidelines compliance. And remember that FADG institutions are federal, US federal institutions, but we cross branches of governments. So while executive branches like NARA have to abide by Section 508, legislative branch like the architect of the Capitol and the Library of Congress uh, may not be mandated to do that by law, but we typically do what our executive branch colleagues do in these matters. So I'll spare you a lecture about the branches of the US federal government, um, but just to quickly say that the executive branch reports to the president while the legislative branch reports to Congress. And there's also a judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court and other federal courts. But the short story is there's lots of overlap here, but in practical terms, it means that some laws apply to some agencies more strongly than others. So with that background, let's look at accessibility at a high level. If you remember back to Charles' slides, there are a number of laws and regulations, such as Section 508, the CFR, which stands for the Code of Federal Regulations, the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission. Um, all of them have input into re accessibility requirements. There's also WCAG, which is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is not federally mandated and is actually run by the W3C as a global effort. Each of the corresponding institutions to different degrees are aware of these and want to comply, but often they don't know how to implement the rules and guidelines. In some cases, they're just not sure what they're mandated to do by law and what they want to do as good practice for them as moral people. But no doubt these institutions want to meet all the requirements to best meet the needs of their users, but doing so has very real practical, financial, and systematic impl Im implications. Um, oops, sorry. Um, also, they don't really know how to go about meeting these needs, even the ones that they are mandated to meet, or even how to tell what applies to them. To just pull a quote from the survey paper, overall, this signals a wide range of applications of the guidelines and regulations set by communities without one distinct standard taking precedence. Different federal organizations, even from within the same branch, are using various accessibility standards and various combinations to tackle these needs. All five are aware of the pressing need to provide accessible content, although the implementation is at varying degrees of maturity. Even without clear knowledge of the specifics of the federal laws and without a systematic approach to doing this work, leading to a myriad of implementation details. So the next set of questions addressed implementation, funding, and workflow. So when it comes to implementation, there's a wide variety of approaches. For example, the Smithsonian uses WebVTT for captions, subtitles, and audio description, and SRT files for other captions and subtitles. Sun Smithsonian Content has a separate video track for audio description. The Library of Congress has several options, including, including the use of TTML and SRT sidecar files for content on lock.gov. The Packard Campus uses both sidecar and embedded captions for preservation and access files via WebVTT, SRT, and SCC files. Another institution uses a vendor to create SRT transcriptions. All FADG institutions use a combination of both external vendors and in-house staff to create captions, subtitles, audio and video descriptions, and transcripts. Some audiovisual collections have existing accessibility features such as SRT or VTT files, but their quality level is uneven after extraction. One institution decided not to work with the extracted SRT content because the manual review and correction took weeks to complete. So how accessibility features are funded is a very mixed bag. One institution has a small dedicated budget for transcription and captioning by an external vendor, and the report goes into some detail about what these costs are. Um, but in-house staff work on quality control and finalization is not separately costed or funded. The Smithsonian reports that there is not a dedicated budget for accessibility and AV content, but accessibility is being concluded, included in more vendor contracts. The Library of Congress reports that funding and metrics are more project or collections based than comprehensive. Vendors are instructed to preserve accessibility content when it is pre-existing, such as embedded captions or languages, but generally they are not directed to create new accessibility content where it was not present in the original. It's interesting to note that the Library of Congress publications likely have accessibility included in vendor contracts, but archival preservation and access projects often do not. Next we have presentation, access, and display. And the survey asked, institu in asked each institution to describe how they present and make available the collection's content with accessibility components. 
Each of the institutions mentioned that YouTube was, an external, was used as an external streaming service, and YouTube can have closed captions. Three institutions also used internal collections platforms or asset management systems to stream video or provide descriptions. NARA's primary point of public access is the National Archives Catalog, where accessibility features are presented as text blocks or text files in e and item level descriptions. The Library of Congress uses a variety of platforms, such as the lock.gov player, YouTube, VLC, um, me media player in reading rooms. Four of the five institutions offer multiple platforms or player options for content. One institution clarified that for the public, there's only one platform or player option, YouTube. However, for internal use, there are multiple platforms and player options. This theme of public versus internal could be seen in other responses as well. The Library of Congress echoed this distinction by explaining that while the library uses multiple platforms and player, players, it does not mean that the same content is available on multiple platforms. Four of the five institutions have approved players that enable toggling on and off of video descriptions, which is very important. Given that there are different platforms and players, it begs the question if and how accessibility requirements differ from the same content depending on the platform. NARA's practice has been to provide captions for content on its YouTube channel and for selected items or by request on other platforms. The Library of Congress acknowledges that the accessibility requirements vary between types of content rather than the platform it's shared on. For example, content provided, content created by the Library of Congress, such as webcasts or events, will always have closed captions. For archival collections, content put online may or may not have closed captions or a full and accurate transcript. While only two of the three respondents to these questions say that they have guidelines or documentation about accessibility features for AV collections content that could be shared, which really drives home the ad hocness of some of this work, it is positively counterbalanced with the reality that, with the, with the good news that five, all five institutions confirm that they have an, an accessibility office or other group within the institution with whom they can engage on such topics. And finally, at the end of the survey, participants were asked, given the opportunity to share about accessibility needs for their archival audiovisual collections. Three institutions expressed the wish to have content guidelines, as it seems there are no existing guidelines and or it can be overwhelming to know where to start. The Library of Congress specifically expressed the desire to prioritize accessibility as part of project planning and budgeting. The Smithsonian proposed uh, some specific areas where guidelines would be helpful, including creating audio, visio, it, audio and video description, like what could be described, how frequently the scene should be described if it doesn't change, et cetera, and getting a sense of the cost for large and small projects. Um, so what are the takeaways from these survey results? That FADG institutional members have increased awareness of their legal and ethical responsibilities for accessibility features for audiovisual collections content. However, they remain very much in flux about implementation methods and workflows due to a variety of factors including the complexity of the content, the limitations on approved applications and tools, systems integration, staffing levels, dedicated funding, and more. So what's next for the FADGI Accessibility Subgroup? We have a few specific steps that are spelled out, like adding the accessibility definitions to our FADGI glossary, which is, if you've never used the FADGI glossary, um, uh, it, it's actually really heavily used, much to my surprise. We get many thousands of hits a month. Um, and we'll sketch out a very high-level template for embedded metadata for web VTT files, which focuses on provenance. Who made this file? How? And that might help with some quality control ex expectations. And we have a few other possibilities, like potentially making sample files and, and uh, model collections, maybe some tool funding, although there is absolutely no promise on that, because <laughs> it's hard to get money. Um, but we're very interested to hear what the community needs as well. We've scoped this to US federal agencies, but the higher-level takeaways are widely applicable. I don't know what just happened there. Okay, so um, Charles and I are the talking heads here today, um, but we certainly want to thank and recognize all of our FADGI uh, folks who worked on this project, so we asked for selfies for those who were game to send them to us. Um, Charles cheated and included his dog, because you can't beat that. Um, so uh, he wins the internet for today. Um, and I'll point out that Crystal Sanchez there is wearing her scarf from iPres if you've been if you were in iPres. Um, and actually, we're, everyone looks delightful. I look like a crypt keeper, but we can um, move on from that. Um, <laughs> so uh, a shout out to all these wonderful friends and colleagues, um, and a few more camera shy folks who didn't want to share a selfie. Um, but it's a great group, and as always, I feel fortunate to work with them in Fadgie projects. Um, so 
that's it for us. Hopefully we have like a minute for questions maybe. But if not, you can always reach out to me or Charles or through the FADU website and we're always happy to hear comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And also a big thank you to Charles for coming through at the very last minute. Um, I think we still have him up on the Zoom if he's available yeah. for questions as well. So we do have a, a few minutes for questions if anybody has questions for Kate or for Charles. Um, Dave. Oh, sure. sure. My question, I wasn't sure, Kate, if you were addressing this, but were you primarily focused on um, pro providing recommendations for when you, when your organization has a hand in the creation of the captions, or would these recommendations apply to like when you're acquiring captions to another source, from another source? Like sometimes I get in captions and they're just, they just kind of look strange or um, they're not necessarily the same quality I would have internally, and then I always kind of debate like is this part of the archival work, or is it like if I'm trying to clean up a metadata record, you know? Right, I think that's one of the discussions that we're having, and Charles uh, chime in here, right? That's one of the discussions that we're having in the subgroup. So um, uh, we were specifically thinking about the, the, this is content that we already have in our collections that we're expected to serve out, uh, but we I don't know that we had gotten as far as guidelines for creating, uh, for asking other people to uh, send us, uh, you know, to, to send us VTT files or, or or SRT files, or like what that would look like. It was more for an internal guidance about what we are doing with the content we already have. Charles, would you agree with that? I would, and um, like, I think that was Dave. I didn't hear who was talking. Oh, but, sorry, that was um, Dave Rice. To go, to go off of that, like being able to switch between like maybe a modern caption that was made for accessibility purposes and then the historical preserved caption, if it is a tape that happens to have that. Um, you know, so the player, we should focus on having players that have that functionality. <laughs> Thanks, Kate and Charles. Any other questions? We can move a very short question, squeeze it in. No? Okay, well, with that, I think we're at time. So thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so much, Charles, Thanks, for Charles. joining us.